Hunting has always been a part of my life and a part of who I am. I grew up in a hunting family here in Southwest Montana, and hunting was always something that brought us together as a family. Like every teen after high school, I was faced with the decision to go to college or get a job. But I didn't really have a clear plan for what I wanted to do. So I signed up as an apprentice in my family's electrical company. I figured I might as well get into a trade where I could make money and learn at the same time. But I was continually drawn to the idea of somehow making a career in the hunting industry. It was all I could think about. So I decided to start filming my own hunts. I realized what I had been seeing on TV didn't really tell our story as hunters. I wanted to capture what it really is that compels us to make hunting such a core part of our lives. And welcome to our debut episode here on Powderhorn, Montana. I'm your host, Jason Matzinger, and together with my friend and co-host, John Edwards, we'd like to welcome you to the show. In our it was hard in the beginning. For the first couple of years, I was working as an electrician all day and editing the TV show into the night. It's almost impossible to get funding when you're first getting started. You're not proven on any level. You have to keep getting out there and showing them that you have a story worth telling. As the show came together, I began to mature as a hunter, as a filmmaker, and as a person. I was starting a family and watching my boys grow up. Things changed for me. What I was doing was no longer just about being successful in the hunt. It became more about what I could do to give back and conserve the hunt for my kids in future generations. Here's your new life member. I started looking at the people leading the effort to preserve wild game habitat and the animals themselves. I began to work more with conservation groups to show people what they were doing to preserve a legacy and a way of life. When I began my career, the hunting industry was all about getting the biggest animal. It was about the kill shot. That's an unsustainable model in today's world, and one that distills an entire adventure down to its most basic level. I want to tell stories about the journey and the craft of hunting. I want to defend my passion in a world that's becoming increasingly separated from its hunting heritage. And I want to tell stories about our greatest natural resource, the wild animals that still roam free in North America. One animal that's always held a special place in my heart is the bighorn sheep. Without a doubt, one of the most majestic animals I've ever seen. Legendary for their agility, they seem to defy gravity as they move effortlessly across sheer granite walls. Witnessing the spectacular clash of bighorn sheep engaged in battle feels primal and surreal. To me, these incredible creatures are a rich part of the wild fabric that makes the West so special. Being out among these iconic animals makes me reflect on where we fit in in the cycles of nature and the circle of life. You start to realize how tightly it all works together. People tend to think the biggest hunting prize in North America would be something large and fierce, a feared predator like a bear. But for serious hunters, the ultimate pursuit is the wild bighorn sheep. Generally, there are two ways to hunt wild sheep. One is the hunting version of the lottery. Pay a few dollars and apply for one of the limited number of licenses. The odds of winning are incredibly small. The second is right here. Every year, thousands of people attend this auction put on by the Wild Sheep Foundation. Most 
come just to watch, as a singular sheep license from several states is auctioned to the highest bidder. The premier tag at this event is the Montana license. In just a few minutes, somebody will be owning the very prestigious tag for the state of Montana bighorn sheep. Montana's been called the land of giant rams, home to several world records for the rams found or hunted here. The Montana tag regularly goes for well over a quarter million dollars. One of the most sought after tags in all hunting, Montana Bighorn Sheep License. I've got 155,000 to start, 155 bids, 160. And thank you, sir, 170. I get a 160, 170, even a 180. 180, 190, 190, 190. That's good, but then I'm going 200. The owner of the tag can hunt in any region in Montana, but they'll likely only go to one place, the Missouri Breaks Monument, called the Breaks by Locals. It's a series of badland areas characterized by rock outcroppings, steep bluffs, grassy plains, and giant sheep. It's undoubtedly the finest sheep hunting in the world. People apply for a tag their whole lives, hoping for that less than 1% chance to hunt wild sheep in the breaks. Most never realize that dream. But that dream is what brings people to this auction and keeps hunters applying year after year for that one in a million chance. And I've drawn it twice. Drawing a bighorn sheep tag is something, no matter where you live in the world, you just, you never really feel like that's ever gonna happen to you. And it's like getting the Willy Wonka's golden ticket in the mail. You, you're one of the lucky few of thousands upon thousands of people who put in for our, you know, limited sheep tags. In 2006, I was actually able to draw a big horn sheep tag. I never thought it would happen, and it happened. And that hunt really, for me, became about sharing it with my father and my friends, you know. I just wanted everybody to be able to experience what it felt like to be out there and hunt bighorn sheep. I want to get him. Just give him just a little. Nice. Nice. Dude. I don't even know what to say. People dream of that right there. When I finally did get my ram, it was it was really cool to know that dad, you know, shared in that experience with me and that meant the world to me. To know that it was probably the only time in my lifetime I would ever get to hold the curls of a big horn. It was a bittersweet moment. And I certainly never figured, even after applying for the rest of my life, would I get a second sheep tag. But at least I can put my money in the hat. At least I can know that my $15 application fee every year is going to help fund wildlife biology against all odds. In fact, I don't know anybody else in the world who has pulled two Missouri Breaks sheep tags in their lifetime. The most coveted area in all of North America, the hardest tag for the biggest sheep in the world, and I've now drawn the tag twice. One of my favorite things about coming out to the breaks is Winifred. With the population hovering just above 200 folks, there's a calm and quiet here that's uniquely small town Montana. Like many communities in this central part of the state, the town was born in the homesteading era of the early 1900s, when the federal government gave away land to settlers willing to scratch out a life from the unforgiving prairie grassland. And there's no doubt, Winifred is a sheep town. 
I often wonder what would happen to towns like Winifred without the income they receive from hunters every year. You know, it's, it's impossible virtually to, do, to talk about any kind of hunting without recognizing that there is some positive spin-over, spill-off into uh, the local economies in which the hunting activity takes place. Hunters spend an absolutely astounding amount of money for their hunting activities for all species, for license fees, in taxes, in room and board, in travel costs, and often with expenditures to uh, link up with guides and outfitters. It does provide money into local economies and for local families and for local businesses. The outfitting business for us you know, we joke that it's it supports our ranching habit, and it might be funny if it was such a joke, but it, it isn't. It's kind of the truth. It's the only way that we're able to ranch is is that we're supplementing our income with the with the outfitting, and the sheep are a big part of that. You can hunt deer, elk, antelope, um, sheep, all your birds. You know, everything is within a you know 50 mile radius. You know, you know, that's the draw for most people coming out here. And uh, yeah, there's no place I'd rather be than right here. The Missouri Breaks is really an amazing part of the world. You start out at the top of the mountains, which are in fact flat wheat fields in the middle of central Montana, as far as the eye can see. And as you get to the Missouri Breaks, it actually breaks off to the Missouri River. Going into it a second time and just looking over the country, all of a sudden those memories started to come back as I looked at, at different um, landmarks and things that I remember looking at. And I just felt like that was home and I was here for the season. Never forget looking out across the valley and the, the distant mountains of just a huge, vast chunk of Montana, just really feeling like we had front row seats. It, I just really looked forward to what the season was going to deliver and how it was all going to unfold. We're getting everything set up here. Beautiful night. The fact that you can drive to a lot of areas in this area allowed me the opportunity to really uh, just have a camp that was comfortable for us and just really submersing ourselves right in the middle of where I knew these rams like to hang out. Got a great spot picked out. We kind of are on this, in this little saddle here where we can kind of get up in the morning and get over the edge and look and be able to spot sheep. I mean, what an incredible feeling to be setting up your wall tent uh, surrounded by bighorn sheep. It's, it's something I've never experienced in my life on any hunt I've, I've ever been anywhere. I'm excited about it. I found some fresh sheep poop right over here, so obviously we're in a good spot. So I'm going to keep unloading, get camp set up, and uh, get some rest. I Got a good feeling about tomorrow. Well, the first morning, I really couldn't wait to just experience walking out of the tent flap as the sun was coming up, the beautiful Montana sunrise, and drinking my cup of coffee while spotting for rams. Morning here, kind of out on this bluff across from camp, just south of camp, overlooking this big gorge. Been here about a half an hour, and I just picked out some sheep. I can see it looks like three or four rams there, but I can't get a good enough look. They're sort of in the shadows way out there. First morning in sheep camp. Man, what an unbelievable uh, 
you know, experience to even be here right now. To be there at my camp and glass down the ridge below me and see rams feeding is just, was worth the price of admission alone. Really sunk in the moment that I was here and I was hunting bighorn sheep. One of the beauties of this tag is the fact that you're going to see a lot of nice rams. Finding the one you want, waiting for the situation. If you're not absolutely in love with the ram and in love with the scenario, don't do it because it's only gonna get better. Just killing a big ram was not what this hunt was about. This hunt was about feeling the sun on my face and taking naps on the hillside. It was about looking at a lot of rams. It was about learning about bighorn sheep and what makes them tick and, and just submersing myself in their world. So that was my goal with this hunt. The experience was truly what this hunt was about. The amount of sheep that you're able to look at day after day is truly incredible. As the days continued to fall by, I, I just kept looking over world-class ram after world-class ram. I mean, we're talking about uh, record book rams day after day. Clear out across the draw here, there's a, looks like a beautiful ram bedded. He, he hasn't looked at me yet, so all I've really got is the side view. I finally saw a ram that just stood out as the next class. There's no doubt he's a whole other class of ram. If I could get close enough, I would definitely put my tag on him. It's a long ways to go with him somewhat low percentage stock opportunity. So it's one of those deals. I know you're not going to kill him if you don't go after him, but I'm just trying to weigh my options right now. In hunting, I've learned that if it doesn't feel right not to push it, there's a reason it doesn't feel right. So we backed out of there. I fell in love with that ram after seeing him, and I, I really made up my mind that that was the ram I wanted to hunt. He had all the characteristics of uh, just an old warrior, and really no other ram would do at that point. Really cool to find that one big dead ram. That's the first ram I've ever found dead. It makes you wonder about that ram, what his life was like, where he's been. As near as I could tell, he was about four, maybe five years old. The last two centuries have been a challenge for bighorn sheep, but that wasn't always the case. It's hard to say exactly how many bighorn sheep originally existed in the West, but we do know they were abundant. Even the most conservative estimates from early naturalists put their numbers in the millions. By the 1950s in the Western US, bighorn sheep got down to 15,000. Unregulated hunting, competition with livestock, and disease seemed to be the three big factors that drove wild sheep numbers down. The late 1800s has been called the era of overexploitation by some, and for good reason. Within the span of a single human lifetime, Entire species, from deer to salmon, were brought to the brink of extinction. Nature was viewed as something that got in the way of progress and civilization, and the animals native to these areas were seen as a source of goods to be sold on the market. Mountain lions and wolves were almost completely eliminated from the landscape. The conservation movement gained traction at the turn of the 20th century, 
when laws were created to limit hunting and national parks and wildlife refuges were established. Those shifts in thinking about our relationships to wild animals and the ecosystems helped many species make a significant bounce back over the course of a few decades. Bighorn sheep, however, haven't had the same success as their fellow ungulates. The bottom line is wild sheep, and particularly in North America, don't pay their way. Unlike elk, uh, mule deer, and other wildlife species, uh, there just aren't enough of them and aren't enough uh, tags to, to raise the necessary funds for their management uh, and their restoration and their conservation. So the Wild Sheep Foundation provides uh, a funding medium for state, provincial, and tribal agencies to help them conserve this iconic uh, wildlife species. Trap and transplant is a large part of the history of bighorn sheep conservation and uh, what we would like to think is restoration of historic ranch. If you have a healthy sheep population uh, over here and your numbers are either gone or very low over here, what would it take to transplant or augment this struggling population over here? And so trap and transplant, capture and movement of bighorn sheep. But over 24,000 bighorn sheep have been moved in about 1,400 actions. So a pretty monumental task. To trap it with a helicopter, net gun, do the vet work, put a GPS collar on it, it's about $4,700. So do the math, you know, 24,000 sheep times about $5,000. That's what it costs to, to do this, this management scheme that we do for bighorn sheep. And now we sit with bighorn numbers at about 85 to 90,000, so three, almost four times um, that historic low in the last 60 to 70 years, but, and we have a long ways to go yet. And yet the idea, the iconic idea of returning this amazing animal, you know, to the alpine meadows and mountain slopes and in the wintertime valleys of these ranges that they formerly occupied is such a powerful one and so much a part of the creed and the credos of the Wild Sheep Foundation that they've maintained this kind of effort over time. So after weeks of really looking for that ram that I had seen earlier, I finally found him, the one that I had been searching for this whole time. Just watching a ram of this caliber at, at close range, it had my heart going. Ram is up and feeding. After about probably 25 minutes, the rams finally got up and started to shift, which gave us the opportunity to drop down in the canyon and close those extra few uh, yards that we needed. I knew this was the moment that I had waited for, the chance that I would have to possibly get up on him with a bow. This could work. Next thing I know, I could just barely see the back of him disappearing over the ridge. I knew that that was my chance, and I, I went for it. As I was kind of sneaking over the hill, all of a sudden, out of the left corner of my eye, he was at eight yards feeding with his head down. As soon as I put the sights on him, he picked up his head and dropped into a little pothole on the side of the mountain and just disappeared. I held it full draw, knowing he was gonna pop up at some point, and the ram came up at 40 yards. 
And at that point, I could have taken him, but I couldn't bring myself to let the arrow go. The ram never stopped long enough. He never gave me enough of a clean broadside shot. He just kept going and then dropped over the hill. Less than 10 people in the world have killed a ram of this size with a bow ever. I just couldn't do it. That was a moment that really defined that sheep hunt for me. It really told me that I was there for the right reasons. And just getting a big sheep wasn't what it was about because that was my moment. I just watched him and the other three rams stare at me, you know, almost like tipping your hat to the animal and, and calling him the victor. I mean, he won. And uh, we had a moment of respect, I think, for each other. And he disappeared. and. I never saw that ram again. <sighs> that was fun. So there's a number of ways that you can go about hunting the sheep here in the Missouri Breaks, and one of them is by boat. I got the invite from a friend of mine. About as easy as sheep hunting gets right there. It's floating down the river you know, glassing big sheep off the, off the boat. Jason actually is one of the other tag holders in the area. It was probably one of my most memorable days all season. This is fun, isn't it? Well, we just uh, cruised about probably 20 miles up the river, and Jason just spotted some sheep up here. Looks like a pretty good ram with some ewes. So we're gonna get it closer. Oh my gosh. It's a freaking boat. It's made out of buffalo skin. It's a buffalo hide canoe, you know? This is a historical place where people recreate what Lewis and Clark went through or come down through here and Pretty sure we saw these guys camp down the way, but this is pretty impressive. We got some sort of insignia here. The Missouri River breaks are defined by their history as much as their geology. Before the homesteaders arrived, the entire region was the home base and lifeblood for tribes of American Indians who thrived in this often challenging landscape. The river was the pathway Lewis and Clark followed on their journey in 1805. The journal entries they made about bighorn sheep were the first time the species was recorded by white explorers in North America. Later on, the Missouri River served as a waterway for trade. The land became a lifeline for homesteaders forging a new life on the frontier. But through it all, the area has remained largely unchanged in the last 200 years. I mean, there's a house there that somebody tried to live in 200 years ago, and that house is still there. So how much different can it be than when Lewis Clark came by? It couldn't have changed much between then and now. It's really cool to be able to feel like you're hunting an animal in a landscape just like our ancestors did, just like they did hundreds of years ago. Yeah, he's pretty. He's got that lamb tip look. It really was uh, an awesome day of hunting and something I would imagine not a lot of people will ever get to do, hunt bighorn sheep from the river. You can tell this rut's kicking in. That's what we've been waiting for. This time of the year, it's an advantage to be on the river and as low as possible because it's the rut season. Bighorn sheep males stay isolated in bachelor flocks throughout much of the year and only begin to descend into the lower elevations in search of females to mate with. When the males and females come together, you'll see the ram stretching their neck and curling their upper lip. It's called the Fleming response, and it's how rams determine if ewes are receptive to mating. Seeing this posture is a good sign the rut is just around the corner. With bighorn sheep, the rut means fighting. Males will square up, rear up on their hind legs, and hurl themselves at each other in charges up to 20 miles an hour. 
The resounding clash of horns can be heard echoing through the mountains as the confrontation is repeated, sometimes for hours on end, until one ram submits and walks away. There'd be lots of times where you'd hear the rams fighting before you'd get to them. You'd be floating down the river and you'd hear just crash, crash, sound like a 22 going off. And you'd be like, yep, there's gonna be a ram down there. And you'd float around the corner and there'd be a couple of rams fighting. We were actually on our way floating back down the river. And as we came around the corner, we noticed a group of rams up on the hillside. And they were kind of acting funny. The biggest ram in the group comes right into the middle of the rams and sticks his head in this hole in the side of the mountain. It doesn't look like this hole is barely big enough for his head to fit in. And he continues to crawl further and further in it. We couldn't figure out what was going on. It was something I've never seen before. It's nothing I've ever heard of before. What is two kind of decent rams in that? Look at the head of that one. There is a U there. There is a U in there. There is a U in that hole. They just hole. dug her out. All of a sudden, through the binoculars, I saw a U's head sticking out of the hole. And at that moment, <laughs> We just couldn't believe what we were witnessing. This ewe had buried herself in the side of the mountain to avoid these younger rams from breeding with her. That's the force of, of only the strong will survive and, and mother nature at its finest. It was just incredible to sit there and witness the rawness of mother nature. It was an unbelievable experience and something I will never forget. One of the other unique parts about the Missouri breaks is how quickly it can get totally impassable. November 2nd, we woke up to below freezing temperatures and instantly the river was froze over. Hunting by boat was now not an option. All of a sudden, all this time I felt like I had, all that went away. Finding sheep was few and far between. Not only do the sheep move when it gets cold, but the snow makes them virtually impossible to spot. They are so camouflaged. The big rams I knew about were gone. I felt like I had lost all grasp on everything I had been gathering to that point, and it got real. I started to get a little nervous. I don't think people understand the pressure that is put on you as an individual when you have this tag. No, it weighs on you a lot. 4,000 other people put in for this tag and you get one of them. You don't want to mess it up. You know how bad everybody wants that tag and you want to walk away with everybody else feeling like you did that tag justice. We just saw a really nice sheet. It does bring a level of pressure that I, I can't say I've felt with any other hunt. And boggled. Unless they're just bedded here right in front of us. Winter also brings a problem for bighorn sheep. Most disease-related deaths for adult bighorn occur in the late fall and early winter. Disease spreads during the breeding season when rams are more mobile and males and females come together for the first time in a year. Wildlife diseases still play a very significant role in the dynamics and conservation challenges facing numerous wildlife species. In North America, one of the clearest case studies of this particular problem pertains to the wild sheep of this continent and the disease transmission that occurs when they come in contact with domestic sheep and goats. And the consequences of transmission to these wild populations can, in fact, be devastating. 
entire populations of sheep can be virtually eliminated by the interaction with even small numbers of domestic uh, sheep and goats. There is every likelihood that we are going to see a continuation of this problem and quite likely an escalation of the problem. There's a couple things that happen. There's some bacteria, and the most common one is, is called Mycoplasma ovenemoniae. If it invades the nasal passages or gets down into the airway, basically what happens is those bighorns drown in their own fluids because they can't expel the junk that goes down their windpipe. If a bighorn sheep comes into contact with a domestic sheep or goat, the first option is to live capture it, kind of a one-way ticket to a research center. Failing that, if you can't, then take it out. And I mean lethal removal. And, uh, you know, I've done it, I've been involved with it. It's not at all pleasant for somebody that's, you know, a wildlife manager or devoted their life to bighorn sheep. Having to kill one is no fun. The, the challenge that the hunting and conservation community has is, is ranchers have been part of us um, and we're a part of them. Uh, and, and so much good conservation work is done on private lands. It puts a wedge between us. Wild Sheep Foundation is not anti-public land grazing. Wild Sheep Foundation is not anti-grazing. Uh, we're just pro-wild sheep. The key here though is education. What we need to do is acknowledge there's an issue and then let's work together in collaborative ways to not only have a vibrant and healthy and growing bighorn uh, population, but have a viable domestic sheep industry. This effort, this need for this collaboration will determine whether that iconic species can be restored for all people. The morning of November 16th, we had been hunting nearly 30 days up to this point. I only had nine days left until it was gonna close and it was time to make something happen. And I spotted a ram that I could tell had uh, really heavy bases. So we decided to get a closer look at him. Although I had been trying all season with the bow, I just, at this point, Getting a sheep and getting the ram that I wanted became the most important thing. So I decided to just pack the rifle at that point. As we worked closer and closer down the ridge, I remember just constantly second guessing myself. And was this really the ram that I had held out for? And, and you know, kind of playing devil's advocate. And every time I looked at the ram, every time I would stop and set up the spotter or put the binoculars on him, he would turn and give me looks from every direction and I would just go, man, that is a beautiful ram. We kept working in closer and closer. Uh, we had the wind in our face. We had most of the day to work with, so I was, I was trying to be patient. I was trying to do everything right, not make any wrong moves, not let him know we were there. The next thing I knew, we were sitting above this ram about uh, 270 yards. I knew I could make that shot. I'm very comfortable with that shot, and um, I wasn't in a hurry. I took the time to really calm myself down. It was really that uh, critical moment. It was so bittersweet. I drug it on for as long as I could, and then he gave me the shot I was after. Taking the life of an animal is never easy. For all ethical hunters, there's a respect for these beautiful animals we hunt, sometimes months on end. We watch them in their element, showing grace and strength that leaves you in awe a lot of times. There's this deep sense of commitment that comes over you as you're about to pull the trigger, and a silence immediately after when you make sure you've got a clean shot. Watching the animal fall brings both elation and something I can only describe as mourning for the life that's just left this earth. But for all the emotional and physical hardship it takes to get a wild sheep, 
the reward is tenfold. Forging that bond with a wild animal during a hunt and then taking its life gives me this incredible connection to the food I'll bring home to my family that will feed me and the people I love for months to come. People ask me if I feel bad about hunting and taking the life of a majestic animal. I'd rather take the life of a wild animal in its natural habitat, to look directly into its eyes after the kill, than to pick up a steak wrapped in plastic and styrofoam without ever knowing what its life or death were like. Hunting is a big part of my childhood, my upbringing, and my life now. It's also a way of life that helped forge existence on the Western frontier. When I hunt, I feel a connection to all that history that came before me and the lives of my children and generations to follow. So no, it's not easy to kill an animal, but it gives me a greater sense of the circle of life and death that connects all of us. Being on a hunt in a place like the Missouri Breaks is a stark reminder of everything that had to come together for wild sheep to inhabit a place like this. It's a massive conservation undertaking, and it doesn't come cheaply. Nowhere is it more evident how important hunting is to conservation efforts than at the yearly special tag auction for wild sheep in Reno. Within minutes, Hundreds of thousands of dollars are raised to keep this species alive in some of America's most rugged and wild landscapes. I've, I've heard a lot of people say I've been putting in for 50 years and not fair that that guy is able to put up a bunch of money and buy his way right to the front and go shoot these world-class sheep. And I do understand why people feel that way. The reality is, Without it, our opportunities as, as residents would dwindle. The Wild Sheep Foundation's tags that we sell raise more than 70% of all wild sheep conservation dollars uh, in our country. In 2013, the Wild Sheep Foundation sold one auction tag in Montana for $480,000. Uh, we average on that tag just around 310,000. That money goes right back to Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks. And that is funding the conservation programs that we need to keep this iconic species on the mountain. 340 where? Let's go. $340,000. So $335,000. Thank you. $335,000. Again, Montana was the highest selling tag. It brought $335,000, and that's just for the opportunity to hunt. That's not a guarantee by any means. Cheap in our country, in the United States and Canada, if those tags didn't bring that money, then they don't have any value, then they're gone. I mean, it's a period, they, they, they won't be here. And I've donated a lot of money that I didn't get a sheep tag for. Everybody goes, oh, I just donated some money to buy a sheep tag, but I've donated a lot, hundreds of other thousands of dollars that have nothing to do with getting something back. It's putting sheep back on the mountain so all these kids can still hunt sheep. If you don't have sheep conservation, we don't have any sheep, period. I have tremendous gratitude for people like Jeff and organizations like the Wild Sheep Foundation that are actively working to keep these animals on the mountains and plains of the Rocky Mountain West. But I have to wonder, is it enough? Or do we need to make a collective mind shift and really understand it takes all of us to keep this legacy intact? We have too few people who care about wildlife and conservation. Those who do care about wildlife and conservation are terribly divided, and we are simply running out of money because this this, this issue is not given a high enough profile by governments globally. Now, what we have to do is to find a way to make sure that this idea, that this resource, that this responsibility for conservation falls to everyone. And to do that, we must seek a way to find relevance for this issue in the lives of every single person in society. It's a problem that we have to solve and it's a problem that we have to solve together. I have my own reasons for wanting these animals continued existence. And yes, some of those are admittedly selfish. 
I want to know where my food comes from, and I want to have respect for the animals that provides that to me. I want to continue a way of life that puts me in nature, with a direct connection to the wild animals that roamed these mountains for thousands of years before humans arrived. Just like my father was there for me on my first sheep hunt, I want to be there for my kids when their time to seek out this majestic animal arrives. But beyond my personal connection to these animals, I know that what really matters is to continue their existence in the world. They are a critical part of our Western legacy. As a part of our public trust, they genuinely belong to all of us. So it's up to all of us to preserve them.